For this episode, we're going to welcome back a prior podcast guest because she had so much to share with us, we couldn't fit it on one episode. And so I'd like to welcome back Aubrey Carey. As we continue listening to her story, from being the victim of a school shooting to the mental health issues that stemmed from that incident. Her story is incredible and you don't want to miss it. If we could just take time to talk about the postpartum depression element too, just to kind of educate people on that. No, absolutely. I guess we'll start with the hospital. I think that's a good place to start because I had my baby and there is nothing in the world like holding your newborn baby for the first time after you've gone through labor and or or a C-section. I did not have a C-section. I delivered naturally, but everything was wonderful. Everything was fantastic over the moon. My baby had some health issues while we were there, but we got through them and everything was great until discharge day. And then it was all of a sudden it hit me that all of these nurses who were, I mean, I think they changed pretty much all of his diapers for me. They just did it. I didn't have to ask them. They just came in and they did it. And they checked to make sure he was feeding and they were checking his vitals and my vitals. And I just felt so cared for. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they're like, okay, go home. Good luck. And I was like, ah, no, (laughs) this is, this is terrifying. But we went home. I was exhausted. And it was like the exhaustion kind of hit me a little extra when we pulled into our house. I was like, boy, I'm really tired. It'll be nice to sleep in my own bed. But how much sleep am I actually going to get? I have a newborn baby. That high that I had felt for those few days in the hospital really started to, to tank once, you know, a couple hours before discharge. And then we got home. And we were exhausted. And of course, there's grandparents and they're just, they're so excited to, to meet grandbaby. And, you know, things were still good. A few days went by. Breastfeeding was brutal. Mm-hmm. It was so mm-hmm. painful. And it was, you're relying on your baby's signals and they try to tell you what those signals are, but you don't have a clue. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're, mm-hmm. you're winging it. <laughs> and, and it was, so that was really stressful. I have said it before and I will say it again, the exhaustion, there's nothing like it. And so everything is now a hundred times harder because you're sleep deprived. Everything, you know, everything that goes wrong is a hundred times worse. And every feeling is a hundred times more intense because you're so tired. That was probably where, where it started to really go down, downhill for me. Um, I had had a, 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 couple friends who had had their babies like just a month or two prior and they had warned me they said the baby blues will hit you out of nowhere and for them pretty much all of them it had happened around you know like they got home from the hospital and it was about five days postpartum three to five days and it hit but it was gone in like three to five days well nothing for me really changed i was exhausted and i was can't say i was like glowing happy because i i wasn't i i was just tired i mm-hmm. think that was just a like a, that was my personality. It was just tired. Then it was actually about day seven. No, no, it would have been closer to like day nine or 10. And that's when things started to get a little out of hand. Anytime my son would cry, I would cry. The first few days when that happened, I was like, okay, these are the baby blues. Give it like three days, three to five days. It'll be gone. Five days went by and things, I I was not getting better. I was not. I found enjoyment in nothing. I would literally, so they they tell you, oh, just nap when your baby naps. You know, just just nap when your baby naps. Well, anyone who's been around newborns knows that newborns sleep a lot, which is great. They eat and they sleep and that's it. That's pretty much all they do. Well, he would go down, he would take a little nap. And so I would be like, okay, let's take a nap. And I would lay down. And I would try to close my eyes and my heart would race and it would just pound and it would be going so fast. And I would find myself hyperventilating and I would be having these ridiculous thoughts, thoughts like, what am I going to do when my, when he turns four years old? What am I going to do when he starts kindergarten? What am I going to do when he graduates from high school? What am I going to do when he gets married one day? Like why? Mm -hmm. Like rationally, I knew 
those thoughts, they're, we don't need to worry about that. That's so far in the future. Let's just focus on now. Let's just focus on he's sleeping and you should sleep too. And I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop obsessing. And, and it would throw me into an absolute panic. And I have suffered from panic attacks for most of my life. And it was terrifying. And I think the most terrifying part of all was here's this baby and I, I need to care for him. And I'm frozen. And I don't know how because I can't even, I can't even take care of myself right now. That was really hard. That was really, really tough to, to work through. And that is where she found me on one of her visits where he woke up so that she could take his vitals and it was time to nurse him. And I burst into tears and I said, I don't want to feed my baby because, because it's so painful and I'm so tired and I don't, I don't want to anymore, but I, I have to, and I'm going to, but I don't want to. And that's where she stepped in. And that's where I got help. Mm-hmm. I'm sure many can relate without a doubt. One thing I feel like if I was in your shoes, I would have been worried about the medication. I can't take medication because what I eat, my baby's eating. So, you know, were you able to, it sounds like you went on medication. Were you able to keep breastfeeding and nursing? with the medication you were on. Yes, I was. There is actually it's the I'm a huge fan of this this pill. I believe it's called Vistaril. Hmm. And Vistaril is an as needed anxiety medication. Oh, interesting. So you don't just take it every day. You take it only when you feel like you need to. And it's it's actually an antihistamine. So it's like a super powered Benadryl kind of, and you know, Benadryl makes you sleepy. Mm-hmm. Well, Vistaril does the same thing. It makes you sleepy. And so when my midwife told me about it, she said, this is what we're going to start you with. It is safe for breastfeeding because the dosage is low and it's only as needed. And because it's just an antihistamine, the most it will do is make your baby a little sleepier. There's only a certain amount you can take every day. And they do tell you, you know, watch for your baby. If your baby is extra lethargic, stop. But overall, it's very safe in small doses. And she said, you only take it as needed. And she said that there are a lot of moms who she prescribes it to who just knowing they have that bottle of pills is all they need. Mm -hmm. And I was actually very similar to that. Believe it or not, despite how awful I was feeling, I think once I got that bottle from the pharmacy and I brought it home, the following, about a month, in that month, there are 30 pills in that bottle. And in 30 days, I took three. Oh, wow. Hmm. That was it. I remember taking the first one. And, you know, when I was starting to have those really intrusive thoughts when I was trying to nap while my baby napped and I took one. And I was able to get to sleep. And I remember waking up and thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I feel human. I can do this. I can be a mom and I can be a good mom. And it's okay. Like it was, it was (laughs) life-changing. And then I didn't need another pill for another week or two. And it was just, you know, again, then the sleep deprivation got to me. Well, and then I started having intrusive thoughts and I took one and was able to take a nap and I was better. And I will say my baby blues, I thought they would only last me three to five days. Like my friends said that it did. Mm -hmm. Mine lasted two weeks and upwards, a little upwards of two weeks. It was, it was more like 16 days. And I got the visceral pills at about... In those 16 days, it was probably about day five was when I first got that prescription. And so took my first one on day six. And then, like I said, I actually, you know, even though the baby blues were still there for 10 more days, knowing that I had those pills there if I needed them actually brought me a great deal of comfort and relief. Yeah. And I didn't even need to take that many. And so there was no need really to worry about any side effects with my baby because I really didn't take them very often. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. You weren't fighting that alone. Suddenly you had a tool. That's amazing. And that's very, very cool. How old is your little guy now, Aubrey? How far out are we from all this? 
he will be 11 months on December 19th. Oh, okay. Very nice. We're almost to the, almost through the first year, which is crazy. I don't know where the time went. Yeah. Yeah. And did you ever feel like you had a relapse later in the year at all with your postpartum? Like you made it through those two week, those 16 days of baby blues, powered through them. You still have your prescription though. Did you see anything down the road later where it kind of hit you again? I wouldn't say that it was necessarily like postpartum related. I have struggled with, I've had mental health issues my whole life. I guess I can't even say my whole life. They kind of started in, in my teen years when I was when I was 13 as a freshman in high school. September 27th, 2006 was the school shooting at Platte Canyon High School. That was my, my high school. Oh, wow. That was my classroom. So that was really traumatic. You have an active shooter. You don't know what's going on. You're crammed into a classroom, into the corner of a classroom, literally piled on top of each other to try and stay out of sight of, of somebody with, with a gun in your school. We were stuck in there for hours. And so that was a traumatic experience that I think shaped more of my adult life than even I'm aware of. I ended up having a really poor relationship with my mom after that. I think the trauma from that had a lot to do with it. My mom, she, I mean, how, how do you, how do you talk your child through that? Right. Right. That's not a situation as a parent that you ever want to be in. You never want your child to be in that situation. And so how do you deal with that? Like it's, you're, it's an impossible place to be. And with that, and, and, you know, my mom was a teacher at the middle school right next door. And so she experienced quite a bit of trauma, just not knowing where her daughter was and knowing that there's, there's someone with a gun over there who, you know, wants, wants to kill students. And my daughter's over there and I, I can't get a hold of her and I don't know if she's alive. So that's traumatic for my mom. That was something, you know, that I think really impacted our relationship because both of us felt unheard and unseen and it was awful. And so I think that's where actually a lot of my terror of having my own child really kicked in was knowing how awful my relationship was with my mom back then. I started having panic attacks about shortly after that experience with the school shooting. My panic attacks started. I developed an eating disorder in high school. I was anorexic. So there was just a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. going on Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh, got into college and things started to improve a little bit in college. And I actually sought out counseling. I went to to the counselor there at Western and that was really helpful to just really help me grow and develop. When I moved to Missoula, I got my first job. I started going into therapy there as well. That's probably actually where my mental health really started to get really bad was in Missoula. And I think part of it had to do with the weather, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, it is. It is a cloudy <laughs> place in the winter. It is. Without a doubt. Yes. Extremely and cloudy. Anymore in the summer, it's a smoky place. And so, yeah. <laughs> and so, so I really was struggling there. That and I think it's also just a hard time in your life when you're 21 years old and you're trying to find your way in the world and where you fit in. And it's just, it's just a rough time. Like people think, oh, you grow through high school and then they make it seem like you have it all figured out and you don't. Right. You just don't. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) And so my mental health there in Missoula was actually pretty poor. And so actually when climbing the corporate ladder sent me to Denver, it was kind of a godsend because then I was closer to my family again. And by this point, it was amazing how just some distance about of a thousand miles um, <laughs> really helped mine and my mom's relationship. Some space actually gave each of us more patience with each other and more understanding, more grace. And I mean, we have an awesome relationship now. I love my mom and I just think she's one strong lady and I just have such great respect for her. But boy, that was rough. And I can only look back now and see how that trauma really affected our relationship that way. But so when I moved to Denver, I actually got diagnosed with schizophrenia. And that was, again, there's another reason why I was terrified of having kids is I don't want to make a baby that's going to be like this, that's going to struggle like me. So I was diagnosed with schizophrenia and was put on medication and I hated it. I hated the medication. It made me dead, like emotionally dead, mm-hmm. checked out, not mm-hmm. even present. And 
And it could have very well been that maybe my dosage was too high and I didn't know. That's totally a possibility because I know that there is medication that is really great and helps people live a normal life. And for me, that was not the case. Yeah. I remember my friend called to tell me these horses that we used to work with, a whole bunch of them, the owner just abandoned them. And so half of them had to be put down and the other half were sent to a rescue. And she calls and she's in tears and she tells me it's these horses that she and I worked with for over a year. And I remember just being like, oh, that's sad. Mm -hmm. And that's when it really hit me. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's something wrong here. That's not how you react when you find out that these animals that you love have had to be put down because they were abandoned. So I, I quit that. The good news is that I hadn't been on the medication for too long. So I think that was the only reason why I didn't have physical symptoms, but but boy, it was, it, was, it was pretty rough mentally for a little while, for a couple of weeks. When I moved back to Montana was really when I started to become a little more mindful about my mental health and just trying to be a little more aware about what my triggers were. And it took a few years, but my diagnosis of schizophrenia actually changed. I went to see a different doctor actually in Helena. She diagnosed it as stress-induced schizophrenia, which she actually linked to being caused by the traumatic incident of the school shooting that mm. I was in, that I was a victim of. And so, and it, there was something about that updated diagnosis that was really freeing for me because, okay, like this was a traumatic event that led to this. But even so, I still have hallucinations and I still have panic attacks. And that's something that uh, my provider through community integrated health knew about. And she kept her eyes open for that. Something my midwife knew, my therapist knew, and my husband obviously knew and has been an enormous help to me. And we, we do have a plan, you know, like that we utilize when I have panic attacks and stuff to help me calm down. And there's probably listeners that are probably sitting here going, Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. Same thing. And I mean, just to air this out and have it in the open is just such a beautiful thing. I'm so glad that you had community integrated health there. That is so cool that this grant program was available, which put this funding in the right hands, which was there to help you and help your son and your husband and your family. Thank goodness for programs like that. On behalf of myself and the podcast crew behind the scenes, I want to give a huge, huge thank you to Aubrey for sharing her story, and for bringing a lot of these issues out into the light. Thank you, Aubrey. And thank you for joining us for this episode of Talking Health in the 406, where we're one community under the big sky. A lot of information was shared on today's episode. And if you'd like to learn more, visit our website at talkinghealthinthe406.mt.gov. And if you haven't already, please be sure and like, subscribe, and share our podcast. Until next time, take care.